here, but essentially um, there's a request to um, implement a well uh, to test for uh, contamination uh, in the water uh, or to continue to test to make sure that it's not there. It's not there now. Uh, but this is not an area of expertise for me, obviously, so I asked Mr. Donovan to come and uh, give us some information on this and thought it was appropriate that the committee uh, approve it. I think they have that in their packet, Mr. Donovan. We do. We have this. Uh, we do, yeah. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, General Electric Company has retained Tetratech. It's an engineering company uh, to conduct environmental assessment work for the General Electric Company upgrading around the, the uh, Druid School. Uh, this work is related to G's former facility at. Uh, sorry, Mr. Uh, a couple members are requesting a copy of the of the map. Sorry, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry, I'll to interrupt. Yep. <laughs> sorry. Oh, to here I found it. <laughs> okay. So Tetra Tech is asked to um, place a monitoring well on the Druid School property in the driveway um, as shown in this photograph. Um, I guess it would be the northeast side of the school. Um, as you may be aware, the G uh, factory that was on Federal Street many years ago um, had some environmental issues in, after they closed down. Um, the Druid School is upgrading of that site. The, the groundwater flow in that area flows from the site down towards the Strawberry Brook on Boston Street. Um, back in 2009 or 10, they came in. Uh, the General Electric Company's uh, agent came in, put a well, uh, drew some water, and, but it was a temporary well. I, I, it, apparently, they didn't feel they had to come back. But they want to come back, and this time they want to put a permanent um, sampling well in. So they'll drill, it'll be a one day affair. They'll come in, they'll drill down, set the water gate, uh, cement it in, it'll be flush with the ground, take a sample, and then they can come back um, quarterly or yearly, whatever they need to take future samples, just you know, taking the gate box off, dropping the test um, sample retriever down and taking the sample. Um, this should not interfere with the school operations. It'll be a little bit noisy the one day they're there drilling. Um, we'll try to ask them to schedule it possibly for a vacation period or a weekend if they can. Uh, and the sampling will just be somebody showing up with a, in a truck and, and there will be no machinery involved in the sampling. Um, once the well's there, you will, won't even know it's there. There's no difference in appearance than a water gate or a gas box on the street. So um, they have wells around the entire site, but they want to put this well in on the site as close to the school as possible so they can say that they've been able to sample <coughs> groundwater underneath the school property. Um, and, and that, in a nutshell, is, is what they're looking to do. Any questions? Member Castellanos. Uh, so just to clear, so is this part of a larger, I know there's been a lot of work around Westland. Is this part of a bigger um, project? I know like we were just talking about this, about the infrastructure yesterday at one of the ARPA meetings. I don't know if that's, is, does that tie into what's been going on out there? Because that whole side of, that area over the last couple of years, actually decade, maybe more, flood in and just, I just was wondering if that's gonna interfere with any of those ongoing projects? No, the um, pr the plant was torn down, I wanna say, I mean, in the 80s, uh, most of the plant was torn down. The factory, the future building was left there until the, the market basket came in. But since that time, down by the Democus's, uh meat plant there there's a little building and they've been treating the groundwater down there pumping it out and um treating the groundwater for uh, it's close to 30 years now so th this is their operation uh because they're responsible for what they did back there in the 40s and 50s and it, it's just it's a continuing operation that they are sampling someday hopefully they're going to have finished cleaning up the site and there'll be no more contamination there yeah lorraine is the chair 
Town. Mayor Nicholson. May, uh, Member Pena had a question, yeah. Oh. Member Pena? Oh, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Have I you have checked to see in with you. the Lindwater Sewer Commission? Have they checked in with the Lindwater Sewer Commission? Because I know there's a well there and there's a couple of uh, drain lines that tie into the old one. Is that going to interfere with any, any um, drain lines? No, they, they, they will dig, do a dig safe and they will contact Lynn Water and so we'll make sure that before they actually do their drilling. This is going to be off towards the property line to the side of the school, yeah. uh, away from any of the utilities coming into that area, but they'll have to dig safe this. Because there's a well there. The, I know where the old well is and we have a drain line that ties into that. I think. Any other questions? Um, I want to thank you for coming and I asked you earlier like I, I made a call to check talk to you about what was going on and one thing I want you to know it's no cost to us at all uh, there's no cost to what to the city at all to the school department and we will make sure that they have adequate insurance on their their driller when they're on site so that in, in case something happened that things would be covered does anybody want to make a motion I entertain a motion to accept. And second. Member Gately? Yes. Member Castellanos? Yes. Member Coppola? Absent. Make a motion to adjourn. Second. Member Thank Gately? You very much for your time. Yes. Thank Member you. Castellanos? Thank you. Yes. yes. Member Coppola? Absent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. <coughs> Appreciate it. Good Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. And we'll refer that motion to the full committee. Thank you, I'd like to call to order the curriculum subcommittee. Member Magnolia? Here. Member Dugan? Present. Member Gately? Present. Um, so our first agenda item is to examine the sex ed curriculum in the schools, and I believe we have a presentation on the current curriculum. I would also like to welcome any of the middle school students who initiated this who are visiting us. Good evening. Um, before I begin, I just want to um, start by mentioning, mentioning that Adolf Graciel, who is the Interim Assistant Director of Health and Wellness, unfortunately couldn't be with us tonight because he is receiving an award down the Cape at the Massachusetts Secondary Schools Athletic Directors Association. So I just wanted a little shout out to Adolph. Um, Congratulations. But yeah, very exciting. So we've been asked to give an update on sex education in our schools. To give a little background, Lynn Public Schools has partnered with Girls Incorporated of Lynn for over 15 years. And in that time, they have delivered sex education instruction to LPS students mm -hmm. via our health classes. Since 2017, Informed and In Charge is the Healthy Sex Education Program. This program is funded by the Massachusetts Department of Public Health and is a 10-session program that consists of a toolkit that includes discussions about puberty, dating, relationships, communication skills, adolescent development, 
sexual orientation, and gender identity. In addition to encouraging students to delay engaging in sexual activity, this curriculum helps to identify, establish, and cultivate healthy relationships. In the handout that I gave you on page two that you received, outlines the topics covered for each grade. On the first page, looking at the data from the past year, past five years, you'll notice that the schools and the number of students served. For example, this school year, Third Good Marshall Middle School and the two comprehensive high schools, Classical and English, are implementing the program. However, there is a lack of consistency in the implementation of this program across our schools, which is a result of scheduling issues and capacity. But moving forward, we will expand to the other secondary schools. The informed and in charge program supports the Massachusetts Comprehensive Health Curriculum Frameworks, which was last updated in October 1999. Listed on your handout are the standards that align with the program. Other standards are addressed, but these are the ones that Girls Inc. have highlighted. The Department of Elementary and Secondary Education was looking to revise these 1999 health standards prior to COVID. But like many things, this was put on hold. The actual initial implementation phase was scheduled for spring 2020 to summer 2021. There was actually three phases. That was the third phase. The first one started in 2018. So all students who participate in the program have an opportunity to take a voluntary, anonymous, pre and post survey. This allows us to gauge the effectiveness of the program and include student voice in future planning. Bridget Brewer, the supervisor of teen pregnancy prevention programs at Girls Inc., has been extremely instrumental in helping us to implement the program at our schools as well as gathering the data. So based on the survey, some of the key findings include students reported improved ability to identify signs of unhealthy relationships. They also had increased confidence in using accurate medical terminology related to reproductive anatomy. They also had enhanced knowledge of different forms of contraceptives and a true understanding of what consent means. Increased respect for sexuality, including gender identity and gender orientation, as well as a clearer understanding and mindfulness around sexually transmitted infections and preventive method methods. This data exhibits that after completion of the program, most students are able to make informed, healthy decisions around their sexual health. Some next steps, next steps for us is to expand the health and sex education program to all secondary schools, as well as to create a committee to facilitate the adoption of a health curriculum at the secondary level. We will also explore incorporating health into the physical education curriculum at the elementary level. I'd be happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you very much. Do any members of the committee have any questions? Okay, Member Dugan. Yeah. A um, couple questions. First of all, uh, you said there's a pre and post survey for students. Mm -hmm. How, is there, you know, a, a strong uh, feedback from students? I mean, where would you rank kind of how they respond to that? So Bridget gave us um, a bunch of uh, data for the five years, and most of the responses was in the 80s and 90s. Okay. Oh, they, okay. um, okay. they felt that the program helped. And then um, in terms of like parental consent, I don't know, I was briefly looking at some of the laws in, in the state, and there is something about parental consent or if parental parents want to or guardians need to review the material. Is there something that goes along with that and with our curriculum? So there's a letter and then it's an opt out. Okay, so, okay, so great, great. Parents can opt out. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, Member Gately. Um, I just wanted to ask because in, when um, Mr. Ganey was here, he told me that we're waiting on the standards to be changed by DESE. Then they would align it to a textbook, and this is for all health. So where are we in that process right now? So we actually deliberately stopped because we were waiting for the standards. We started in 2018, 
And then um, that was phase one. And then phase two was right when COVID hit. Yes. Spring of 2021. But we realized we can't wait anymore. So we will get a team together, a committee together to look at that. Okay. Hopefully the standards will be coming. I mean, I checked. I called a couple of people at DESI and I didn't get a definite answer on that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, Member Castellanos. Thank you so much for coming tonight. I want to thank all the students uh, for showing up tonight. Very uh, important to get student voice and input in our policy decision making efforts. Uh, so I know the standards. I know when we were talking about mental health curriculum and obviously sex ed curriculum, my last um, experience was on the advisory. advisory health, yeah. yeah. So, so what? Where are we at with priorities through the advisory? So we still have, we have to schedule, you know. Well, I have, that, that's yeah. what I was, right. I, so I wasn't sure. I just wanted to make sure we get that reactivated. Right, um, absolutely. And I definitely would like to, when we talk about next steps and what we could do, I think having those conversations in the advisory um, meetings are helpful because you get to work with Bridget, you get to work with all the different stakeholders involved and you really get at the root of what we're looking at right now. And just for the public and people in this room, we have an advisory uh, council that we, we discuss these public health issues. A lot of the, we, we, we set precedent every year. Like we reevaluate whether it's vaping or, right. we, we, we go through these issues, um, but ultimately when you hear student input, I think it's a very big, big push. Um, and, and, and I wasn't sure, uh, is, is Zachary, Zachary Lucas here? Or Zachary Lucas is one of the people, one of the students who wrote this letter, I believe? Or was this a sample? Um, I think, so I have all of the students' yeah, emails okay, okay. here, so. I saw a lot of emails too. I just yes. would like to, um, so this email, I mean, I mean this, this was a pretty, you know, a, an example just for the public. I want to read this. Um, some of the samples that we get, uh, this is what's, what's some of the requests from a student, right? Sure. Says my class and I are doing a civics project and we have chosen sex ed and we are trying to advocate to get Lynn Public Schools an agenda, an agenda curriculum on the matter. We know that you are on the school committee's admin and we were just wondering if you could get our message through, the, through to them and try to get them to work on the situation a little quicker. Teen pregnancy is a big problem in a lot of places including Lynn and a lot of people in Lynn don't even know how high schools offer birth control which was a good step, but in other places, kids know about birth control and they have sex ed, which in studies has shown that having sex ed decreases teen pregnancies. Mine and other classes here at Bree Middle School really think that this is a big problem and that something needs to be done about it. And I say this in the nicest way, <laughs> immediately. <laughs> My class has discussed and we think that it is appropriate to have a curriculum for sex ed sometime between the school year of 2022 and 2023. I personally think that having a curriculum and it being taught in more schools will help people and help people and cause teen pregnancies to decrease. Uh, this was Zachary Lucas. But we get so many, we get a lot of these, and we do, sure. I read them all, and they're powerful. Um, it's important to, to, to really listen to where our students are coming from. And it, there's, we, we're in a different era. It's a very, you know, I, mean, I don't say it's not, I don't think it's an effort thing. I think it's more of a, of a, let's be a squeaky wheel kind of thing. We have to speak to Desi to say where we're at with the standards, like how we could get removed from the sticky place. I think we got to figure out where we are, right? To see where we are and activate where we need to activate so we can continue to see, you know, progress. Sorry. Agreed. We're going to actively look to get the committee together. So I have a couple questions. Um, some of these are specific and some of them are kind of uh, aspirational. Um, it's my understanding that right now um, the delivery of this curriculum in the middle school is only being done for girls. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. So I would like to make the recommendation that as we look forward to curriculum that people of all gender identities be included there. Um, I think it's really important um, that people who identify as male get this curriculum, people who identify as female, people who identify as non-binary or somewhere else on that spectrum feel included. So as we look towards that curriculum, I would say that we need to pay attention to the naming um, to make sure that all students feel included. Um, my second question, and this is sort of the aspirational one, is um, right now Girls Inc. is delivering this curriculum, and one of the challenges has been um, scheduling and capacity. 
Um, is it LPS's uh, platform that going forward the curriculum would be continued to be uh, delivered by Girls Inc. or is this something we're looking to do more in-house with our health teachers? So we're looking to get a curriculum, a math uh, health curriculum, and then that would be um, implemented through our health teachers. But I also think we've had such a long-standing relationship with Girls Inc. We would try to incorporate them also um, into it because they've done a fabulous job and they've made some really good relationships. Wonderful. Yes. Yeah, so I, I just want to make sure that capacity is not our challenge exactly. as we expand to FECTO, as we expand to tech, and as we make sure that all middle schools are, are covered. Um, and I, I would hate to see the um, lack of, say, grant money that is coming through that mass DPH grant mm -hmm. be the reason why we can't have this curriculum in all of the middle and high schools and then expand it to the appropriate topics for elementary school, such as bodily autonomy things like that that would really I think address some of the issues that come up in that specific um, setting yeah, agreed member Coppola okay. and then member Pena okay hi uh, um, first of all I'm wondering if um, on scheduling in the in the high schools I, I I thought that there was a actual class where they get credit for health so we do have a health class, okay. yes, and, and Girls and Inc. comes in, the teacher stays in the class with Girls Inc., but Girls Inc.'s uh, uh, members are the ones that actually um, deliver the, the, the program. Okay, so it's not delivered by our no. staff at all. Okay, and um, the other thing is that um, when Francis, you know Francis Sudek, Sudek yeah. when she was here, um, she did a program where she took volunteers that were um, both male students and female students and she had a program together where she went and did um, you know to present it in an auditorium to the middle schools and to the high schools now she did that for about a good 20 years but when she retired whoever took over did not continue that program um, any chance that that can be brought back because if you've ever been to that program when they had it you could hear a pin drop because these are peers to peers yeah that the program um, is. I'm not I know I know um, Francie but I, I wasn't aware of the program that she did so um, if we can you know if you can give me the name of yeah, it I can I, I will to, um, to yeah I'll I'll find out I, okay. I forget she she actually had a name for it and um, even kids that had already graduated from our high schools would come back and speak and to the talk students to the other, in regards talk to, kids. to it. Okay. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. And I'll call around too. Yes. And um, I, I get quite a few calls from parents in regards to um, issues where the uh, girls are being sexually harassed and they don't feel as though, you know, it's being um, addressed, whether it's in the schools, you know, with administrators or whatever. It's not being addressed, and um, some a few of the parents had asked, "Is there any way to include in the curriculum what the consequences are? You know, if you go out in the world and you're doing this, you know, you're talking about arrests, mm. maybe incarceration, and you know, um, letting them know how it would affect jobs." You know that they would be able to be hired for because of quarry problems and things like that mm. um, you know I know you're talking about uh, putting something together and it's not out the and ready but um, these are things that parents are asking for so I'm just wondering if it's possible I know one particular parent she wanted to know if the coaches could speak to the boys in regards to it you know have it be part of um, something that they go over with with the athletes because it's a continuing problem all the time there I mean I definitely think that uh, we'll get a committee together and you know we'll brainstorm mm -hmm. all the different uh, you know we'll reach out and ask stakeholders students parents and and try to um, come to a consensus about what what's okay. going to be the best actually even in we did it we put a had a survey out and even that survey um, a lot of staff responded to that and mentioned that that they're you know that's happening and there's no consequences so 
I mean, this isn't just parents saying it. Okay. You know, and maybe the it is. I mean, we're, it's talking about staff. So. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Eva. Thank you, Member Pena. Oh, I have three questions. It was answered by yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I do want to stress, you know, it's it's really important, especially with our student athletes, uh, mm -hmm. to pass this mm -hmm. along because it's a culture where where we need to teach the boys like what's appropriate and what's not because there's there's a culture that happens with athletes and 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 as you know we we hear mm -hmm. it, it, we, I hear the complaints also there's a there's a line that we need to teach our boys because there are consequences when they continue to college with this behavior there, mm. there's consequences you know once you're an adult you know no longer there, there's things that could affect you you know your future with job life you know job things you know and uh, Donna mentioned all the things that I you know I'm concerned as a as a father of boys, you know, that are in, in middle school. I I like as I have an athlete, so I like to educate them, like what's appropriate, what's not, and it's a very important topic because we have you know we have males that need to be educated, and, mm -hmm. and you know, so thank you, and I appreciate your presentation. Thank you, and the students. Thank you for coming down. Any other questions? Oh, Member Castellanos. Just have one clarification. Sorry, just I have a clarifying question. For the standards, I know we said the so it was 96 was the last time it was 99. up? 99. 99. 99. Yeah. No, no, it doesn't necessarily mean we haven't touched it since 99. I know we review, we kind of oh, yeah. evolve. I, mean, I think clarifying that for the public, though. Because oh, okay. yeah, I this was misinterpreted with the mental health curriculum. Because oh, okay. folks, I remember talking to Mike about that, in the, in, about the, the mental health curriculum. It's not like we're still making efforts to be with Right. The, the standards still apply, but there are new things that have happened, like vaping. Somebody mentioned yeah. vaping. Some, oh, right, you mentioned vaping. And then there's also um, social and emotional competencies, mental health. There are uh, things that are going to go into the new standards that weren't in the 1999 ones, but they still are standards. We still follow them. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that. Well, I just wanted to clarify because it, it, when folks hear like the, I see the item in the back. There's like 1996, <laughs> like 1999. You know, I just want to make sure that's okay. clear, so we don't have to leave here and folks are just you know calling us to clarify. Okay. Thank you. That's why you're here. That's right. Thank you. And I'm going to ask as this committee gets underway, you give us reports along the way. But I think Member Gately has one more sure. question. Yes. He just triggered something in my head about the 1999 standards. Um, what happens, maybe we should cover that a little bit, because what happens is the standards come out, then the textbook companies, they start aligning to those standards, and then they come to you, and that's when you should have a committee already so we could look through them. Yeah. And that will be happening. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have the high school ELA adoption. My name is Allison Mosho Hamilton, and I'm one of the assistant directors of ELA. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Just checking. I am here with Michelle Winslow, the other assistant director of ELA, Phil McQueen, the ELA department head at Lynn Classical, and Aaron Doherty, an ELA teacher at Fecto Leary. We are here tonight to speak about the grades 9 and 10 ELA curriculum adoption. So I'm going to start by framing the why. So DESE, in the quick reference guide, Assessing Your Curriculum Landscape, addresses three main pillars in choosing a curriculum and maintaining curriculum literacy. Ready access, high quality, and standards aligned. You can find DESE's definitions of the aforementioned pillars on our PowerPoint. On our PowerPoint. With the current contract with Houghton Mifflin ending in June of 2022, finding a vendor with a rigorous, culturally responsive ELA curriculum that provides equitable access for all students in grades 9 and 10 while also meeting the three pillars was of the utmost importance mm -hmm. to the team. When 
when choosing the team, it was vital to have inclusive representation across all high schools. We had Lynn Classical, Lynn English, Lynn Tech, and Fecht O'Leary, including ELE and SPED, and the committee members are listed on the PowerPoint. So Michelle's gonna start by walking us through the timeline. Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> Thank you, Allison. So with that in mind, the ELA committee began the process of curriculum review starting in March of 2021 and continuing through January of 2022. The choosing of the vendor started with an examination of the following resources. LPS District Strategic Plan, where the team identified the following strategic initiatives as most relevant to our adoption process. 1.2 and 1.4. You can find both 1.2 and 1.4 strategic initiatives on the PowerPoint. Aligning the ELA adoption with the district initiatives was a crucial task as we wanted the new ELA curriculum to help move outcomes. From April to May, the team also examined DESE's Implement Mass Guide, which is grounded in equity for students and outlines an inclusive four-phase process to select and implement the high-quality instructional materials that best meet each district's local needs. Curriculum ratings by Teachers Rubric, also known as the Curate. The goal of the Curate is to make it easier for districts and schools to lay a foundation of great curriculum materials in every classroom so that teachers can focus on making those materials work for the students that they know best. Ed Reports, an online resource that provided a strong starting point for conversations about our curriculum adoption, since the reviews helped communicate with teachers about materials under consideration, as well as with district leadership about recommendations. And lastly, in June of 2021, the ELA team partnered with Drs. Melissa Winchell, Kevin McGowan at Bridgewater State University where they delivered professional development to the ELA team relating to the creation and review of the Curriculum Assessment Framework for Equity, our CAFE document. This document provided another critical LPS lens. These rubrics are available for you at the front table. And Phil will carry on with the process. Good evening. Um, Following the initial review of the adoption process materials, the ELA committee attended vendor presentations in July of 2021, where the team was able to wrestle with both digital and physical resources, including student and teacher editions and demos. Um, the five vendors were uh, McGraw-Hill and StudySync, Achieve 3000 with Actively Learn, Savas, My Perspectives, The American Reading Company, and Horton Mifflin Harcourt into literature. And these resources are available on the table over there as well. After the presentations, the team was provided with newsletters that continue the Zoom record that contained the Zoom recordings and the logins to the demo accounts. This allowed the team to easily re-examine the resources. In August of 2021, the team met, met to rank the vendors and place them against the CAFE rubric. This was an important step as it fostered necessary conversations about equity and culturally responsive practices. In December of 2021, the team met to unpack the reading literature, reading informational and writing standards to gain a better understanding of how the adoption materials could help identify and measure student learning targets while also promoting mastery and vertical alignment. I'm gonna hand over to Erin now. Thank you. In early January of 2022, the team completed a vendor choice survey and remained split on two resources, StudySync and Actively Learn. The team felt that StudySync fit both DESE's and LPS's expectations of high quality instructional materials due to its strong focus on equity. Additionally, StudySync is comprised of comprehensive instructional materials for teachers, including lesson plans and assessment cycles. StudySync is also greenlit by Ed Reports. Moreover, the team strongly believed that Actively Learn should be considered to support our multilingual learners. I will now highlight the major features of StudySync. 
StudySync is a digital and print core resource that integrates with Schoology, our learning management system. Having StudySync as a core will give teachers access to culturally responsive materials and common core standards-based instruction through their comprehensive lesson plans. In addition to their four curricular paths, thematic, novel, American, and British, there is a continuously growing library of over 1,900 works, including 275 full texts. To make content relevant to students, there are also high interest podcasts and blasts with engaging writing prompts. With the range of choices in the StudySync library, teachers can design lessons that help students understand and celebrate the nuances of different cultures and authors, such as James Baldwin, Nelson Mandela, Arundhati Roy, Jasmine Ward, and Toni Morrison, to name a few. Lastly, there are technology tools and multimedia features that will help with student access, engagement, and understanding. These tools include annotation, authentic audio recordings, and closed captioning. An important feature to note is that StudySync is accessible on any device, desktop, laptop, tablet, or mobile phone. We will now show a quick video that introduces StudySync. <coughs> I'm here today to introduce you to StudySync, a living, dynamic curriculum. Today's learners are immersed in an innovative and rapidly changing world. We type where we want scripted. We stream videos where we used to rent movies. We send messages with a click of a button, and we expect immediate responses. But what about our classrooms? What are we doing to ensure excellence and equity for every one of our students? Dr. Doug Fisher says every student deserves a great education, not by chance, but by design. StudySync is built to do just that. Imagine, all of your students engage with rigorous and culturally relevant content. All of your students building skills, held to high expectations, and reaching academic goals. All of your students inspired to be strategic readers, writers, and communicators. It's all possible with StudySync. So, how do we do this? In three ways. First, when it comes to equity and access, McGraw-Hill education is second to none. With StudySync, teachers create a responsive learning environment, equipping every student for success in college, career, community, and beyond. Second, StudySync is flexible. Teachers are empowered with tools to monitor progress and tailor instruction. Finally, StudySync is ever-growing. We're continually adding to and updating the program to keep it relevant. Okay, so I'm going to go over the major features of Actively Learn. So Actively Learn is a digital-only supplemental platform that helps deepen student learning by facilitating collaboration with both students and teachers through a catalog of texts and videos. Actively Learn has a library of 650 high-interest articles, 200 textbook selections, and 190 videos with instructional scaffolds and higher order questions to help students access rigorous texts. And the library is also uh, constantly growing. For teachers, um, actively learn, they can add their own websites, videos, or PDFs, and turn them into interactive lessons with shared annotations, embedded questions, media, and immediate feedback. Teachers can also modify any actively learn instruction and customize it to their students' specific needs. For students in actively learn, they have access to text-to-speech, a built-in learner's dictionary, translation into over a hundred languages, and dyslexic reading settings. Based on this, it is clear that accessibility is embedded in the platform in addition to multicultural voices being elevated with their thematic units. These voices include Asian American and Pacific Islander, Black History and Literature, Indigenous Heritage, and LGBTQ History and Literature, among others. We're now going to show a brief video that highlights how Actively Learn can support our multilingual learners. So, from the student point of view, um, you can also model how to use some of those amazing tools we have in the platform. And some of those tools are um, defined. So anytime you look up a single word, um, it acts as a dictionary. So 
You can highlight one word and you can use the define tool. And you can also listen to that. The text to speech is enabled there. If I really want to use my translation tools, I can highlight an entire paragraph. I can obviously translate. Let me select Spanish. Um, and then I can also, I, if I have a student that reads really well in their primary language, they can go ahead and read that. And if I have a student that isn't quite as literate in their first language, uh, but maybe they um, listen to it really well, we can go ahead and, and listen to that as well. Esta información proviene de la Comisión de Juego del Reino Unido. So these tools are available um, in any text in the platform and even in anything that you bring into the platform. So this is where uh, teachers can model using those tools for students. Okay, so I'm going to walk through our final reasoning and recommendation. So in a moment of complete serendipity, we received word that McGraw-Hill acquired Achieve 3000, the parent company of Actively Learn. This worked to our benefit as it allowed us to create a new option for our adoption, to synergize both products and create a robust set of resources with rich experiences for teachers and students. McGraw-Hill provided a crosswalk to demonstrate how to incorporate both programs into teaching practices, which you can find on the table of products. So to quote a member of our committee, based on the sample unit plan provided, this would be a huge time saver for teachers to have a core curriculum texts and supplementals already paired and aligned. As you know, teachers spend countless hours searching online for supplemental materials to complement core curriculum texts in order to increase student achievement and make learning interesting, relevant, and meaningful as possible. With these two platforms already, quote, in sync, much of, these, much of this time-consuming work is unnecessary, allowing teachers to focus more on actual lesson planning and teaching of content. Additionally, for novice teachers, this would serve as an invaluable resource as the units are models in and of themselves as to what effective teaching should look like. Michelle is going to walk us through how to use both resources. So in terms of implementation, study sync will function as the grades nine and 10 core program with actively learn providing supplemental and interventional solutions, in addition to high interest articles and extension activities. Study seek lessons are designed to be flexible, giving teachers the opportunity to select optional activities to enhance learning and differentiate from all learners. This flexibility allows the space for actively learn to support and build on the core instruction while providing a continued exploration of ideas connected to the theme and additional standards aligned practice. In adopting both programs, we would be offering equitable access to excellent instruction and educational outcomes for all of our students. If approved, the current curriculum maps for grades 9 and 10 will be revised and will reflect a crosswalk of the two programs. So as a department head of Lynn Classical, I want to share my excitement about the combination of Study Sync and Actively Learn. Using these two programs will give us the opportunity to reach the needs of all of our students. Most importantly, students will see themselves in the core and supplementary texts, and they will have the opportunity to engage with attention-grabbing activities. Uh, I would like to echo Mr. McQueen's excitement about these two dynamic platforms, and note we are aware that successful implementation will mean that students and teachers alike are given time and ongoing support to learn to navigate both sites so we can take full advantage of what each program has to offer. So lastly, we also wanted to take this opportunity to share some exciting news coming out of the ELA department. <laughs> In school year 22-23, um, we will be piloting horror literature and Latin American literature both of which will be supported by Study Sync and Actively Learn at Lynn Classical and Lynn English with the possibility of adding a world mythology elective. The addition of these electives are the beginning of reimagining school's work and a necessary move towards more culturally responsive, engaging content for our students. So in closing, we hope you have a solid understanding of our process and final recommendation. As a department, the ELA teachers and leaders wholeheartedly believe these two resources will provide our grades 9 and 10 ELA students with the equitable, rigorous education they deserve and need, while also helping them develop skills necessary to thrive as 21st century citizens. We will now take any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Member Gately.
We have eighth graders in this room. Could you give me a quick thumbs up, <laughs> thumbs down, or sideways? <laughs> How do you feel about uh, this? I think it's exciting. <clears throat> thumbs up, okay. thumbs down, sideways. <laughs> So next year when you go on to your high schools, if it's implemented correctly, then you will be taking this exciting new program with all these um, links. Now back to you. I want to thank you very much for this presentation. I hate the way they have this table set up because I can't see you <laughs> too well. I can't see Michelle at all. So um, <laughs> thank you, Michelle. No, I don't have to see them in the back. I just see you because you're presenting. So um, this is exciting. I'm so glad that you made this presentation. I think it aligns with the, um, was it the social, the civics, the civics curriculum in the ninth grade, I think, or eighth grade, they did similar. I was extremely happy to hear about um, the language translation, especially for the special needs, dyslexic. I think I mentioned that to you before, um, Michelle, at another meeting. Um, I want the committee to know that, um, I'm sorry, I called you Michelle, <laughs> Mrs. Winslow here, applied for a GLEAM grant, and could you explain to the committee about the GLEAM grant and how this impacted this ELA curriculum? Oh, absolutely. Um, so in particular, that GLEAM grant, um, we were recipients of it as of early June of last year. The Department of Ed, so we had a team working together in the district to, um, support so essentially we're following the same platform and this in particular one was for k-5 for elementary this particular implementation piece i kind of got the charge rolling early in my in my um start in the curriculum department and then sort of took the reins over with allison mosho but in terms of the um exciting news about the glean grant that is a k-5 adoption process in which we are following the same process for the department of ed with the implement mass process oh it's a really rigorous four-step process and at the same time, we also um, have available a lot of really incredible professional development through the Department of Ed and a collaboration with the Health and Literacy, in which they're, you know, it, it's not just to be here, let's try to get you through this adoption process and do it well and be very rigorous, but to have sustainable um, momentum that stays with us in an ongoing process to you know, enhance literacy practices across the elementary, but also um, utilizing all of these strategies at the same time K to 12. And how much was that for? Um, the first year, it was uh, well a little bit over 200,000. Mm -hmm. You know, just going forward, it'll be. I just Ooh. like to. Thank you. Good, exciting. I can't morning. thank you enough. Sorry, I'm done. Okay, a member. Lot people, a lot of great team members helping. Thank you. Member Dugan. Yeah, so uh, just to echo what uh, Member Gately said, just congratulations on all the hard work and thank you for the, the wonderful presentation. It was, it was very informative. I really liked the fact the supplemental materials, being a teacher myself, uh, looking through for supplemental materials to enrich and, you know, just to, to make sure you're reaching all your children, it does take some time. So I think that's going to be a, a huge piece of it. Um, you did mention for novice teachers that the curriculum's modeled. Uh, could, would that be... You know, other teachers, you know, for example, Mr. McQueen would maybe go to a, a newer teacher's classroom and model, or that is, it, how does that work? I guess that's my question, yeah. So that can be one of the um, things that actually happened, but I think when we were talking about modeling, we meant actual formal lesson plans. Okay, okay. So within study sync, there are, it's like soup to nuts. Everything you I can see. possibly imagine is there for teachers. Okay, I see. So it's not actually, because when you said it, I was kind of envisioning maybe a video or, no, you know, yeah, okay. What a formal lesson I gotcha. Lesson. All right, great. So, but thank you. Great. Thank you for a great presentation. And yeah, looking forward to seeing how it works. Thank you. Member Castellanos. Just to echo what everyone said, thank you so much for tonight's presentation. Uh, very informative. Appreciate it. Uh, to walk us through that. Um, I had multiple light bulbs go off as you were <laughs> delivering that presentation um, and one of those um, light bulb switches was the way you guys tied in the strategic initiative uh, 1.2 and 1.4 uh, I was part of that process of when we developed it and I always I always refer back to that document um, just as just as the I seen it from birth to where we're doing it now and to see the the actual uh, results it really puts a smile on my face and it just 
it's a testament to that process um, and to see that, like, the, just the follow through um, and, and just the, the time that you guys put into that. And it takes a lot of work. And it's definitely, um, it's you're building legacy and you've got students coming in here to see what we're doing. And it's just, it's actually really, it's inspiring. Um, Every time I hear Mr. McQueen speaks, I'm inspired. I honestly, <laughs> I, 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 he has me like, you can hear like a, 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 a little needle drop. I'm just, I'm laser focused when he speaks. I, all, all of you today, thank you. I appreciate it. Member Coppola. Okay. Um, the, when was the last time that we um, purchased or had um, ELA curriculum? I'm it was around 2010. 2010, okay. Um, because in a survey, a lot of people are like, things are changing so quickly. Um, some of the other questions that, um, or comments that people brought up in the survey has a lot to do with um, us being on the cutting edge. So, you know, hopefully you can all say that this is cutting edge for curriculum so that they, they feel as though uh, they see that coming. Yeah, we actually got um, shout outs from McGraw Hill for marrying both programs. Mm -hmm. um, and they were really proud of the work that Lynn is doing to have the core with the supplement. Okay. Who did the uh, co committee consist of? Yep, so it consisted of all of these people. All of those people. <laughs> okay, <laughs> great. I can, yeah, we didn't want me to know. Uh, if you want to give them a shout out, and okay. they can get, yeah. Okay. Noelle Bolio, who's the ELA department head at Lynn Tech. Shannon Conlon, the ELA department head at Lynn English. Amy DeRosa, the assistant ELE director. Aaron Doherty, Mark Feldman, an ELA teacher at Lynn Classical. Kathy Ford, an ELA teacher at Fecto Leary. Amy Glidden, an ELA teacher at Lynn Tech. Travis Harris, an ELA teacher at Lynn Classical. Phil McQueen, myself. Claire Price, who is the SPED department head at Lynn, uh, Lynn Tech. And Michelle. Okay. So lots of times they say, you know, they're the people with the boots on the ground and, you know, they don't have much say. So that, you know, it shows that you did. The, um, the other thing is, did you get us a $200,000 grant for this? <laughs> I know, I'm just asking, why didn't you? <laughs> what is the cost for this? Does anybody know what the cost is for this? Program. I don't have that information. It's okay. All right. Thank you. I have some nuts and bolts questions, if that's okay. Um, so I'm wondering about the um, active interface with Schoology um, in terms of teaching the students to use an LMS platform because of what they can expect should they be college bound. So can you talk a little bit about how students are going to access this material, not when they're on the school grounds? Yeah, so um, both Study Sync and Actively Learn integrate with um, Schoology, and both programs are available offline if you download um, everything in advance. So if, even if you don't have internet access, okay. you can get access to um, both programs. Okay. Um, and one of the, the reasons I ask this, I am a professor at North Shore, and one of the things that has become really clear during the pandemic is that the learning curve to understanding how to interact with um, textbook companies' LMS plugins um, is actually quite steep for a lot of students. And so I'm particularly excited by the fact that they will be learning how to do this in ninth and 10th grade. Mm -hmm. um, the analogy I always give is it's like when they enter the enter the class, it's almost like I have to teach them how to walk down the hall and sit in a chair because they're just not so familiar with how to engage in the classroom that way. When I say, did you look at your book? And they're like, I don't have a book. And I'm like, yes, it's in the class. Like that's where your book is. So just wrapping their brains around those kinds of things um, I think is really beneficial, and I, I want to give a shout out for that forward thinking because not just at North Shore Community College, but at colleges and universities across the country, that is much more how students are accessing course materials, um, whether they be through the library or through the course themselves. Our library has plugins into our LMS so that we can put things on reserve that way, just so you're prepared for the 21st century here. Um, so I, I just want to say thank you for that because I think it's a version of preparedness that um, is really going to serve them later, especially if they become our early college students, um, because that is how faculty will expect them to access materials. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. So I will entertain a motion. 
Sure, I'll make a motion to uh, accept the recommendation of the committee um, for grades 9 and 10, where we synergize, study, sync, and actively learn for our students. Second. Second, but move it to the full. Yes. And I'd like to also uh, motion to move it to the full committee. Dr. Magnolia? Yes. Mr. Dugan? Yes. Ms. Gately? Yes. Thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank well you. Done. Thank you. I'd entertain a motion to adjourn the curriculum subcommittee. Motion to adjourn. Second. Dr. Magnolia? Yes. Mr. Dugan? Yes. Ms. Gately? Yes. Subcommittee adjourned. Lorraine. <laughs> oh, yeah. Donna. Donna. Yep. call the personnel subcommittee to, to order um, roll call please member Coppola present member Gately present member Magnolia present okay. and dr. Tatweiler good evening so in your package you received a draft uh, posting for uh, a new position called a human resource generalist recruitment specialist uh, in that draft posting, there's a very clear outline of uh, the requirements, uh, qualifications uh, for the position, also uh, a clear outline of the essential duties uh, that this individual would perform. I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have on those, but I'd just like to say about four or five things uh, about this position uh, before uh, we, we go to questions. Uh, the first is, um, you know, I know that um, many are aware that our human resources department has been understaffed for a long time. Uh, and we've been actively working on addressing the capacity needs or the capacity challenge uh, in that department. Uh, this 
uh, proposal uh, is an important piece of addressing that challenge. Um, over the years, we've talked about actually uh, in my uh, school year 1920 uh, goals, there was a detailed language around uh, proposing this very position uh, to, with specific hopes around recruitment, uh, because that's a function um, that is not uh, able to be performed. Uh, with the existing model and framework in that department. Uh, we got waylaid by uh, the pandemic, uh, but I, I think we're in a really good position now uh, to entertain uh, this important addition. That's one thing. Uh, another thing that I'd want to point out, uh, and I, I think this is uh, really important to stress, there are 10 functions uh, listed or essential duties and responsibilities listed. I want to make clear that right now, only one person does those 10 things, and that's the executive director. I say that to underscore, first, the capacity challenge uh, involving the executive director doing these things, plus all the other uh, responsibilities that an executive director of HR is responsible for, um, but also to name that uh, no work is being taken away from any, any existing members of the HR department. Uh, this uh, new position would essentially allow us to expand on some of the things that the executor, executive director does uh, or can't do because she doesn't have the capacity uh, to do so. The other thing that I want to point out that's important is this is not a position that was proposed in the FY22 budget. Uh, it's my intention really to propose this for the FY23 budget. Um, uh, if the committee supports uh, this proposal, it would be our intention, however, to post this probably within the next three weeks uh, with hopes of getting this person on board mid-June, uh, which I've spoken to the business administrator, Mr. McHugh. We have the flexibility to accommodate that. Um, I don't want to wait until July to post this and have this person come in during what is the busiest time for that office. I'd like for them to be able to come in, get acclimated, and actually be able to lend a hand during the busiest time. The last thing that I want to point out is uh, there was no salary range uh, in what was sent to you. Uh, I'm proposing precisely the same salary range as I did for the position that you approved at our last meeting, a range of sixty-five dollars to $80,000. Happy to answer any questions you might have about this. Yes. So in and among the essential duties and responsibilities, um, there's nothing about uh, specifically like traveling to recruit. Um, and I just wondered if you envisioned this position as someone who would, because of how many schools of education we have in our, I don't know, say 35 to 50 mile radius, um, you know, even though Handshake and the other platforms that recruiters are using right now do not require travel, there is still a benefit to traveling to an education department to actively recruit. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not suggesting that you have to state that, but I think it's important for someone to know if travel is going to be part of the job, that that would be part of the posting. Mm -hmm. It absolutely okay. uh, will be an expectation of this person. That's really one of the limitations mm -hmm. um, that we've experienced over the years is that department, no one in that department has the capacity to leave and go out and develop those relationships and make those connections. The expectations that this person would do that. And schools of education, absolutely. But then there's other organizations that can become a pipeline for new folk there. Uh, in the district. So. so I might recommend adding a bullet point yeah that specifically outlines that because if it is essential then it should be under the essential duties and responsibilities yes dr tetweiler um this looks like the human resource directors a large portion a large chunk of her job that we when we hired her a lot of these things are already in that position mm -hmm. So would be taking away these responsibilities? No, it would be enhancing those responsibilities. Um, you notice in a lot of these um, bullet points, uh, the verb is enhance or support. 
Um, this is an enhancement of some of the responsibility. Now, this is not an exhaustive list of what the executive director of human resources uh, is responsible for. This is actually, um, actually a little bit more um, narrowed in in terms of specific responsibilities related to recruitment, uh, re related to analysis of hiring trends, analysis of attrition trends, uh, which absolutely is in the, the broad scope of the executive director, but there's a whole lot of other things that that person is responsible for. And you know, this addition uh, would allow uh, the executive director to be more successful uh, at doing some of those uh, things where there is crossover. I would like to see, I would like to make a comparison of the two because it, it just, to me, it seems like we're just adding another position and I don't know, I just would have to see it to compare it. So I, might I would be happy to do it. that, uh, but I would say to you, um, Ms. Gately, that if you took out the job description for a deputy superintendent and a superintendent, there's a lot of similarities and crossover. If you took out the job responsibilities between a principal and a vice principal, there's a lot of crossover between what those two people would do. Uh, but you need those additional people to, you know, create the capacity so that all of those things get done well. I'm telling you right now, there are things on this list that don't get done because there's not capacity to do so. So I just mentioned to Dr. Magnolia, we don't have the capacity to develop uh, the kinds of relationships and have members of HR out in the field, making those connections, developing those relationships. Uh, we do go to you know the big recruitment fairs, Merck is coming up. Uh, which is one of the state's larger recruitment fairs. Um, we do go to that, uh, but w there's a lot more that we could be doing, which is why I proposed this in my uh, 1920 goals, which the committee recept uh, accepted. Thank you. Um, oh, yes, Mr. Castellanos. Um, so I'm looking at the essential duties and responsibilities section, um, and I could see where Member Gately feels like it looks like it's similar um, in how the HR, how that position reflects the duties that we're looking at. Um, but I do also see what you're talking about around ref like designing. When you look at employee engagement and designing like the, the referral programs, internship programs, Establishing those relationships. It's really it's big in development and ha having the I, I understand the, the capacity to do that It's it's going to enhance hopefully the pipeline features the partnerships um, our, our visibility expansion and that does take a lot of legwork Because um, it's true like when you have it's hard to do that when you're trying to your, your core you know, you're planted on core operations so to 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 do that outreach is very difficult, whether it's hitting a hiring event or they say, not, not even just Salem State, because we this is here, but there's Harvard, there's MIT, there's a lot of other right. institutions that we can't tap into because ne we don't really have that capacity. Mm -hmm. I do, I see that. I would like to see this more detailed if that's, like I feel like this This is, I like the points, mm -hmm. but kind of break that down. Like there's a lot more, there's a lot more meat in there. Like when we talk, that's a lot of work, right? Like when we talk about partnership development, so I feel like having a, a, a deeper di a dive on those duties, because there's a lot that can come about that. Like those, fe like I feel like this, I, I like this, actually I do like that. Mm -hmm. I think it's around the area of development, um, that's, I, I have that, that experience with Salem State being on their development committee for the alumni board for Amherst State's alumni, you know, I've seen pipeline development. I've seen what we're doing here with other districts. Mm -hmm. I see it, and I, I do appreciate that because we need to. Um, these are different, robust plans that need to put us in position to compete. So, and I, 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 see, I just think it's in this particular post, and I would like to see some language at it around responsibilities kind of separate from because it does i've read the, the other our current question for her position as well the one we have now right so when i read this one it kind of it, it's still it, i would like to separate it so claire keep the roles it well it's not it's it's related because she it's, it's a supportive feature right so it's a support mm -hmm. position but yeah i mean it, i appreciate what you're saying i 
I just want to understand what that exercise would lead us to, okay. right? It, you know, so I can do that. I can add more detail to what's listed here. Uh, I also want to be mindful of, you know, job postings that are very long, aren't attractive uh, to people, but uh, I can add more detail to it, absolutely. Uh, I think it might also be helpful uh, from the standpoint of understanding comparison. It can also provide you with what um, Lawrence, Lowell, uh, Brockton has for their HR departments. I think you would see uh, why I'm proposing this position. Yeah, you know, I, and maybe I, wonder yeah. why I'm not proposing more. No, I, I do. I see that. I do. I do. I, and I just was more along, like, along. My thought was around benchmarks and how we. You know how we're going to measure this position. Like, the, how do we measure the value of this job? I mean, when we put, say, if we're if we're paying eighty thousand dollars on this job, I like to see the progress. I guess I want to love, love to see what those measurables look like. Mm -hmm. um, to get that's when I think about specifics. Like, if I see a duty of responsibility, I would like to see a, a way to show me that you've done the work and show me. You know, I want to see evidence of what was done. You know, just to. Just for just if the, if the, just for the taxpayer, just for folks to know what we're in. I get it. Like, there's a lot of value here, mm -hmm. so let's it's it's just transparency. That's all I'm saying. I <clears throat> completely respect that. So I would be happy. This feels like maybe not part of the posting, but more part of me coming back from an accountability standpoint to say, look what your vote did in terms of our ability to now do. Mm, 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 mm. I would I would be happy to do that. Thank you. Are you? No. Dr. Magnolia, did you have another question? Um, I, I was going to make a motion, but okay, if you have a question, I, have I want you to go first. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. My concern is we had two administrative jobs there over the years, and. We decided not to do it that way and to put in the executive director of human resources at $130,000 so that we, um, we would hire somebody that had all of those skills and that's how we were saving. But now it doesn't seem like we're saving. We're back to two jobs again and we paid the first one the $130,000. And I was on that interview committee, so um, it you know we were very clear that recruitment, recruitment, recruitment was the what it was, and um, you know it was very clear that everybody we interviewed we wanted them to have those skills hit hit the ground running because it's one hundred and thirty thousand dollars, and that's what we did. Now it seems as though we're bringing on another job anywhere from 65 to 80,000 and I know um, when she first came on she did send some of the clerks out you know down to North Shore and they were having a re having a thing there for recruitment uh, it was a, like a job fair and so they were able to do that but my biggest concern is is I get a lot of complaints on um, our site isn't that easy, but now we just hired a communication specialist. Would he be working on that piece? Uh, we have not hired that. Piece. No, it's okay, posted. it's posted. Um, yeah. Okay, but and there's some the wonderful candidates. Okay, uh, so that person would work very closely with HR, and that's one of the things that we're very excited about is leveraging the skill set uh, and capacity of the communication specialist to help with. You know, whether it's, you know, getting things on social media or advertising, you know, something special that's going on related to uh, our pipeline um, efforts. Uh, so absolutely, that person would do that. Uh, the event that you're referring to um, was uh, when the union, right before the uh, school year started, they hosted a, uh, like a vaccine awareness uh, event and people could sign up to get the, the vaccine. And uh, we were also using that as an opportunity to message to parents that there were paraprofessional uh, positions. Uh, they did, there were clerks absolutely that went down there with mm -hmm. her to set up. 
Um, but I, I don't see that as being their, their mm -hmm. function, mm -hmm. um, to do that uh, outward uh, partnership development. Um, I'd also say that uh, I'm thrilled that there was support in uh, allowing us to establish an executive director. Um, since I've been here, there's only been one administrator uh, in HR. I'd have to go back and research uh, when there was a, a second um, administrator in there. To my knowledge, there's not been. And I'd also say, to my knowledge, in seven years, there's not been the capacity to do the kinds of things that are listed in this document. The current executive director has hosted uh, virtual job fairs, has gone to the Merck conference, is deeply engaged uh, in recruitment efforts. It is limited because so much of, because of the other demands of her work. It can't just be that this person would have the capacity to do that more frequently uh, and be out in, you know, whether it's uh, schools of higher ed, uh, or, or other organizations that would be, um, you know, that would help, whose partnership would help around our hiring efforts. Like, th th she just doesn't have the capacity to do that. Uh, this person would, would, it would definitely help with that effort. And the other thing is, I, is this how the job posting is going to go out looking like that? Because, I mean, we've had this in the past, and for some reason, I, uh, in my opinion, numbered things seem to be better than the bulleted, but um, you know, it, it's a total different look on it, but this one is easy to read. I don't know if it's just because it's been around a long time, you know, it's been around longer. Um, I'm happy to adjust this however the community thinks that I should. Um, the key for us is the substance of what's in here. Uh, and the ability to actually okay. uh, attract someone to help us. Do you mind if I? Oh, process. I'm sorry, Maya. Yep. Yeah, I just had a question. If that's yes. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, one of our one of the superintendent's goals uh, that the school committee approved, that I know is a top priority for everybody on that committee, is is around recruitment, um, and particularly in the the recruiting a, a diverse staff at Lynn Public Schools, uh, which I know is a is a is a is a uh, a lot of, a lot of work, you know, and we've we've set sort of a specific benchmark and made some incremental progress. But even the, the benchmark we set is is, is uh, very measured um, in the in the uh, way we're going. But I know it's something that that you, Dr. Tell, well, have have thought a lot about and worked on mm -hmm. over the years, um, and one that I can I can say that is is a, is a huge priority for a lot of the community. I think we've heard it time and time again about the importance of having a diverse staff in the public schools um, and you know we have the plan uh, that, that you, you set forward about uh, ways in which we're uh, attacking that um, and I was just wondering if some of these some of the capacity that you are uh, looking to add here um, would be helpful there and if you could talk so, sort of more specifically I mean I did some member Castellanos was point about what we think the outcome of this position is about about um, how how those that th this position would would could, could help us towards mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. that goal. Yeah. So I'd like to make a motion then to just table it, and as Mr. Colasolano said, if you can maybe fine tune the whole thing, match it up to what you know what would be different for us. I mean, if you could answer the question, I mean, it, obviously whatever the will of the subcommittee is, but I thought we were doing questions. Oh, okay. Go ahead. So just quickly, uh, this position, I think, would be instrumental to our effort to recruit and retain a racial and linguistic diverse, r racially and linguistically diverse staff, uh, which is why uh, pretty much since uh, 2019, <clears throat> it's been in my goals to propose a recruitment position, and now we're here. Uh, and so uh, I think, you know, much as uh, I explained earlier, it would be important to have me come back and you know report out whether it's you know quarterly or twice a year whatever the committee would like and talk about the kinds of things that we are now able to do or have the capacity to do, to do that helps us achieve that goal um, I mean this is um, in part a capacity uh, issue like we don't have the capacity to do the kinds of things that we believe we need to do to achieve that goal which is why i'm asking for this 
Um, I think I would need a little more specific direction around what I'm doing here. Um, am I creating a table that, uh, you know, putting the responsibilities side by side so the committee can see the differences or the, um, the, the similarities? I'm happy to do that. I just want to be clear, you're probably going to see similarity uh, because the executive director is responsible for all of it. So the fact that, you know, there are things that you see that are similar here to what's in her posting or what was in that posting um, sh should not be odd. Um, what this person is doing is allowing for deeper capacity to achieve those uh, things outlined in the duties. One person cannot do it yeah. all, which right now, that's what we have. And I'm happy, to, I'm happy to do that for you. I'm just giving you that forewarning that, that you mm -hmm. probably will see some similarity. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, Mr. Castellanos. Uh, maybe having the executive director come in to talk more, uh, even in, in deeper, like, you know, I, and, and that's something that she can come in and mm -hmm. it's one of her passions is her studies and she could probably come in and enhance that perspective just to give us that additional, um, you know, just that, that, that information that we need. Um, which, I, I, if you feel comfortable, do you feel like, is that something that would be helpful? Do you think I'm she'll... happy to bring anyone here who you think uh, <coughs> would help you understand something uh, better. I just, I, I don't know what she's going to say that's different than what I've said this evening. Okay. She's going to tell you, because we sat and we co-created this posting, gotcha. that she does not have the capacity. I already knew that, which is why in 2019 I proposed this. The previous head did not have the capacity. It, it has not been something that we've been able to do substantively for the seven years that I've been here and probably much longer. But I'm happy to do that. Yes. I'm a little confused. Uh, Lenny's next. Okay. okay. Uh, I understand now. One of the, um, what you're looking for in um, experience in education is uh, that person being bilingual. Is that correct? Sure. Oh. And a connection to Lynn. Absolutely. Very, it's a strong signal. Mm -hmm. An understanding of the concepts of institutional and structural racism and mm -hmm. bias in there. Mm -hmm. I like that. I like that. Just wanna, mm -hmm. I, I believe that coincides with the core values that mm -hmm. uh, we're trying to hold the superintendent under and uh, mm -hmm. recognizing those. I like this. Just want to point that out. Ms. Gately. Uh, Mrs. Capola, I didn't know if you said tabling it. I did make a motion, but then I broke all the rows by letting everybody speak so so are you still putting up the motion to I, table? I am and then, and then I will second okay. it roll call please member Coppola yes member Gately yes dr. Magnolia no motion to adjourn second member Coppola yes member Gately yes <clears throat> Member Magnolia? Yes. Adjourned. So we're running a little behind, um, but we do have the agenda of the open mic. Uh, so the open mic session is designed to provide an opportunity for citizens to express their views on matters of concern to the school committee. The sessions are not designed to encourage debate or lengthy exchange of views, but are to have the committee understand numerous points of view. The committee would appreciate speakers keeping their presentation in three minutes in order to accommodate as many people as time permits. The chair reserves the right to limit the number of speakers on the same topic to three. All speakers must be at least 18 years of age or enrolled in a high school in the public school district and having discussed their views with a student government representative. The chair reserves the right to rule the speaker out of order if he feels that the speaker's comments are personal in nature. If a speaker's comments are directed at a school committee member or a member of the school administration in attendance, that member through the chair may address the individual. The sessions will commence promptly 15 minutes prior to the start of the regular school committee meeting. There's a list up here. Uh, is anyone here to speak at open mic? Yep, great. You could just, yeah. You sign in there and then your name and address.
we got a feedback? Um, first, I want to introduce myself. My name is Jenny Winter, and I'm here to speak on behalf of my students from Breed Middle School. I grew up in Lynn myself, and I attended Lynn Public Schools. I've been a social studies teacher at Breed uh, for the last seven years. A few years ago, we began an action civics component of the eighth grade curriculum. Action Civics teaches students how to identify a community problem and equip students with the skills to address these problems. It emphasizes student voice and empowerment. With respect, I would first like to express my surprise and disappointment to learn that my middle school students are not permitted to address the committee directly. But I am appreciative of the invitation to speak on their behalf. I would like to ask your permission to invite my students to stand behind me <coughs> while I write their statement. Absolutely. Absolutely. <coughs> Thank you, guys. Okay, so I am about to read the statement that my students have prepared. Hello and good evening, um, members of the school committee. First, we would like to thank you for the opportunity you have given us to come here tonight. Our class was given the option of working on a civic project for this school year. The class took a vote and decided to work on teen pregnancy. Our class chose this subject because we see that, that it is important for students to have a future without worrying about the difficulties of teen pregnancy. In 2016, Lynn's pregnancy rate was triple the Massachusetts state average, which is a huge crisis in our city. Only 40% of teen mothers finish high school. Teen parenthood is associated with a range of adverse outcomes for young mothers, including mental health problems such as depression, substance abuse, and post-traumatic stress disorder. Teen mothers are also more likely to be socially and economically disadvantaged. We would like to ask you for a sex ed program for all middle and high school students in Lynn. This would include that the curriculum committee incorporates student representatives from both middle and high schools when choosing the program. We want a culturally responsive sex ed curriculum that represents the cultures and the identities of the Lynn public school community. Thank you for your time and we hope you consider our petition. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. <clears throat> anyone here? Anyone else here look, wishing to speak at open mic? Anyone else for open mic? All right, we're going to close open mic, and uh, we'll start in, in a couple minutes. Let people file in. Thank you, students, for coming. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, I have to go to the house. One. Hey, what's good? What's good? I saw you there. Uh, doesn't matter. Look at me too. <laughs> Look good, girl. All right, did your mama too? Just do I saw her. She had the same birthday. I said, oh, I knew that. She looking good out there. Love that. Hmm? Lenny, what happened? Donna's chair is stuck <laughs> under the table. That's not working out, Lenny. <laughs>